Okay. Um, so our next speaker of this session is uh, Joe McManus uh, from Oxford, and he'll be talking about course characterizations of planarity in paleographs. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, I might have too much content, or maybe I don't have enough. We'll see. Um, in the run throughs, it seems to be the exact right amount, but that never works. So we'll see how that goes. Anyway, um, uh, this is a talk about calligraphs. So you should all know what a calligraph is, but if you don't, that's what a calligraph is. So we have a finitely generated group, we have a generating set. Uh, and well, what do we do? We have a graph where the vertices are the group itself and the edges correspond to multiplication by a generator. So if you haven't seen this, then I don't know what you're doing at a geometric group theory conference. Um, but anyway, we'll see lots of examples. Uh, but of course, recall the title, this is a talk about planar calligraphs. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about them and just talk about what is known. Um, later, we'll talk about something a little bit different. But a group, remember that a graph is called planar if it can be drawn in the plane without any edges crossing. Um, and um, I'm going to use the term planar group to mean a group that admits a planar calligraph. Um, and I'll say virtually planar if some finite index subgroup admits a planar calligraph. Um, so, for example, cyclic groups, free groups, and fundamental groups of surfaces all admit planar calligraphs. This is kind of easy to see. Um, so let's talk about planar calligraph for a little bit. So what are the finite ones? Um, well, this is one of the oldest results in geometric group theory and group theory in general, actually. Um, so before Max Dane really popularized calligraphs, people did think about them a little bit. Um, and we have this wonderful theorem of Mashka from 1896, uh, which, I mean, if you read this paper, you realize that they didn't really know what a graph was at the time. It's a bit of a mess, um, but they, they characterized that um, the only finite groups for planar calligraphs are the obvious ones, and then it's A4, S4, and A5, um, uh, which is nice. These are exactly the group finite groups which act by homeomorphisms faithfully on a sphere. Um, it turns out interesting. Um, but A5 has 60 elements. How the hell does that have a planar calligraph? I mean, it looks something like that. It's crazy. This is a figure from Mashka's paper. Um, quite enjoy it. He also draws all of the other planar calligraphs. Um, so if you do look at that paper, look out for the figures and try not to look at anything else, um, is my advice. Um, anyway, uh, so let's talk about the infinite planar calligraphs a little bit. I'm not going to say too much because it's, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said. Um, but the one-ended planar calligraphs essentially correspond to, um, well, they are what's called planar discontinuous groups. Um, these are something that's well, these are objects that are very well understood. They're basically like wallpaper groups and hyperbolic equivalents. Um, uh, if you want to read about these, read the book on them um, by uh, Zishang, Vought, and Caldway. Um, this book was in German. It's from like the 1950s, but John Stilwell, who translated says trees, translated this as well, as well, apparently. So, you know, it's probably a good read. I haven't read it myself, but um, I've looked for it uh, anyway. The main thing that I want you to think about for one-ended planar calligraphs is that they are all virtually surface groups. So they all have some finite index subgroup, which is a fundamental group of some closed surface. Um, and that's the only thing that's really important right now. Um, so what about the infinite-ended calligraphs, I hear you say? Um, before someone says two-ended groups, I don't want to talk about two-ended groups. They're not very interesting. But infinite-ended groups are interesting. Um, and if you want to start talking about infinite ended groups, you run into this problem of accessibility, um, which I'm not going to go into too much detail about, but I just want to sort of give some moral feeling as to why it's important. Um, so uh, well, what, what do I mean by accessibility? Um, let's say that a finitely generated group is called accessible if it can be you know, factorized, quote unquote, as a graph of groups, whatever that is. Um, with finite edge groups and vertex groups with most one end, which I basically mean it's some factorization into big pieces where the big pieces themselves don't break down any further. Um, and if you if you aren't really comfortable with graphs of groups, uh, don't worry about it. All I really want you to think about is this is this main takeaway, um, which is that if you have if you have a class of groups that you're studying. Uh, and you understand the one-ended groups, and you understand that this class of groups is accessible, um, 
then essentially any problem in this class of groups, um, you know, structural problem, tends to reduce quite nicely to the one-ended case. You don't have to do much work to take the one-ended case and consider um, bigger groups. Um, if you don't do this, then you run into problems of inaccessible groups, and it's a bit of a nightmare, but I think we don't need to talk about those. Um, so um, you know, with that in mind, what about the infinite-ended planar Cayley graphs? Well, um, if you combine theorems of Levinson, and Maskeet, uh, Dunwoody, and some observations of uh, Carl Droms and collaborators, uh, they show that uh, planar groups are in fact accessible, um, which is wonderful because, um, as I mentioned earlier, we already understand the, uh, the one-ended planar groups. And so um, using this result, we get a pretty good handle on, um, on the infinite-ended ones. And in particular, what we do notice is that all planar groups are virtually free products of free and surface groups. Um, it's not too hard to take the previous observations and deduce this. Uh, which is which is nice, and you can yeah virtually planar groups are completely characterized as exactly these virtual free products. Um, yeah. So, what's next? Ah, can we do better? Um, slight sidetrack, but if you know, can we do better than this in terms of understanding what the planar groups are? And the answer is like, well, maybe in some directions, but there is some fundamental issue which is um, our old friend, the adyen rabin theorem. This isn't important for the rest of the talk, but if you apply the adyen rabin theorem, it turns out that um, that it's undecidable given a presentation of a group. Does it have a planar Cayley graph? Is it a planar group? That's, you, you can never know unless you find out that it is or isn't somehow, um, but a priori, you can never know. Um, uh, but you know there is a there is a nice positive result. So it was asked by Carl, Str Carl Droms and some collaborators as to whether um, you can somehow characterize them in a way that you can start to list the planar groups um, effectively. And this was a this is a big pair of papers by um by Jorge Coppolos and Haman from about twenty fifteen. Um, but it turns out you can. It is uh, what's called semi decidable whether a given finitely presented group has a planar Cayley graph. Um, so essentially, they present this result that says that a group has a planar Cayley graph uh, if and only if it admits a presentation which satisfies some certain combinatorial rules. Uh, and so in doing that, if, you, if you're given a group and you want to know if it has a planar Cayley graph, it's enough to sort of list presentations using, say, pizza transformations and see if a presentation of this form pops out. Um, but if, if it isn't a planar group, then this algorithm will never terminate. Uh, but yeah, this isn't a talk about algorithms, so I just thought that was a nice result that's worth mentioning. Um, so let me remind you about the, the title of this talk once again. It's at the bottom, Course Characterizations. This is a talk about course geometry. Now, we're all geometric group theorists, so we should know what a quasi-isometry is. Uh, if you don't, uh, there it is. I'm not going to read this definition because it's a 25-minute slot, but... Um, uh, Essentially, two metric spaces are quasi-isometric if you have some nearly subjective map, which nearly preserves the metric up to some kind of bounded error. Um, you know, and this is the sort of fundamental, well, one of the fundamental tools of geometric group theory, because all Cayley graphs of a given finitely generated something are QI. Uh, there's a word missing there. Um, uh, and of course, what I'm getting at here is that it's interesting to ask, given that each finitely generated group has some kind of... Uh, fundamental QI class attached to it. Um, it's interesting to ask now, uh, you know, what other objects can exist in this QI class? Um, who knows? Um, but this is my my uh, moral philosophy and propaganda that I'm going to try and push on to you is for, uh, is for virtually planar groups are really, really strongly characterized by what sits in their QI class. This is the, this is the moral of the story. Um, and this, you know, the story essentially begins with the following uh, uh, ridiculously important theorem. So, uh, you know, it originates in work of mess with uh, contributions from Dukia, Gabay, Catonian Greece, and there's probably more names that I have missed out here. But if you have a finitely generated group G, and it is uh, quasi-isometric to some complete Riemannian plane, so take your plane and put any garbage Romanian metric on it as long as it's complete. Um, 
then it turns out that actually the only way this can happen is if your group is virtually planar. So it ends up being QI to either a real plane or a hyperbolic plane. Um, so, you know, this is our picture. We have some a priori, we have some quasi isometry with some, you know, garbage plane. It's got loads of mountains on it. Um, and then, yeah, it ends up being a virtually planar group based on just this little geometric object sitting inside the QI class, which is very surprising. It's a huge theorem that I think one way of proving part of it uses Gromov's theorem of polynomial growth. And then, you know, the convergence group theorem, it's ridiculous, uh, but very nice. Um, Anyway, what's ah, and I should mention that alternative proofs and extensions of this fact have been given by Bowditch, uh, who gives a, a great list of characterizations of virtually planar groups, um, some cohomological, some in terms of the fundamental group at infinity. Uh, it's uh, they're very nicely characterized in a lot of ways. Um, and then uh, Mayor uh, gives another proof and also uh, extends it to some surfaces with like planes with boundary, you might say. Um, simply connected planar surfaces with geodesic boundary, I think is what the paper's on. But um, uh, anyway, this talk isn't about these these results. Um, but check those papers out because they're both very good. Um, so uh, one of the main results that I want to uh, advertise is rather than looking at groups which are QI to planes, we look at groups which are QI to planar graphs. So um, we're given some group and we look in its QI class, we rummage around and see what's in there. And in there, we find in there some, some random planar graph. We find the graph which happens to embed into the plane. It's, uh, there's no other assumption on this graph. It's just, uh, you know, I know it could be ridiculous. Uh, what do we know? What can we say? Um, and so the first result that I want to advertise is, uh, is the following. So suppose G is one-ended and quasi-isometric to a planar graph then it turns out that you can upgrade that planar graph to be itself a complete Riemannian plane. Um, and in particular, by the previous results, it turns out that our group is virtually planar, um, um, which is nice. So uh, why is this interesting? Well, some one-ended planar graphs are not QI to planes. Uh, so for example, here is a planar graph. Uh, you can kind of imagine it as a, as a half plane with lots of holes taken out of it. Uh, this is not QI to a plane. You can, it's not coarsely simply connected or whatever you want to say, but it's not QI to a plane is the problem. Uh, and a priori, there's no reason that this shouldn't be uh, QI to some finite generated group. Um, so uh, what's going on there? Well, it turns out you can rule out examples like this and then uh, things start to work. Um, but now that we know the... Uh, now that we know the one-ended case, uh, you know, we can go back to the, the philosophy that I said before about accessibility, which is once you know the one-ended case and you start to know that your groups might be accessible, you can start to deduce much more general facts. So um, here is the other theorem from this paper, which is uh, probably more important. Um, so if we have a group which is quasi-isometric to a planar graph, any, any group now, um, but it turns out that that group is accessible. Uh, and this is a this is an absolute pain to prove. Um, but uh, in proving this, it means that we can now say something like um, we can combine the, the this with the previous result, reduce to the one-ended case somehow, and we deduce that uh, if we have a group G which is quasi-isometric to a planar graph, and it turns out that this group is itself virtually planar. So just any planar graph lying in your QI class. Uh, it turns out that these end up being, well, this is enough for your group to be virtually planar. So somehow this QI class is just any random bit of garbage that falls in there has the power to completely restrict your group to one of these virtually planar groups, um, which I think is quite interesting um, and maybe a bit surprising. Um, right. So once again, I will draw your attention to the title of this talk, which is course characterizations. There's a plural there. Uh, so I'm going to talk about more characterizations. And the, the next ones I'm going to talk about are, are they relate to graph miners. Um, so if any of you haven't studied much graph theory, then you should recall that a, a graph H 
is said to be a minor of another graph gamma if h can be obtained by contracting edges of some subgraph of of gamma. Um, so, yeah, you should you should recall maybe Kuratowski's theorem that says that a graph is planar if it has no if and only if it has no k five or k three three minors. Um, uh, so, you know, these are a very important object in graph theory. Um, and it turns out that, uh, well, uh, I've got ahead of myself. Uh, let's say that a graph is called minor excluded if there exists a finite graph, which is not a minor of it. Um, so this definition only really makes sense to infinite graphs. Um, uh, so planar graphs are, of course, minor excluded. Um, but, you know, if you take like three-dimensional three lattice, this is obviously not going to be minor excluded. It's somehow too big. And you can start to draw any finite graph you want in there. There's enough space. Um, um, and minor exclusion does have some consequences for Cayley graphs, which are worth mentioning here. So um, firstly, we have some theorem of uh, Anakukro, which says that if every Cayley graph um, of a group G is minor excluded, then it turns out that your group is virtually free. Uh, and vice versa, this is an if and only if statement it's completely characterizes the virtually free groups. Um, and on the other end of the uh, quantifier spectrum, uh, there is a recent paper of uh, Asparo Giacanti and Legrand du Chesnay, which uh, can be used to show that if some Cayley graph of your group is minor excluded, um, then it turns out that your group is virtually planar. Um, so say you've, you draw your Cayley graph and you realize that there's no I don't know if there's no clique of size 1 million or something like that, or no complete minor of size 1 million. Uh, it turns out your group is virtually planar, and so its, it's structure is quite restricted. Um, the converse of this theorem is not true. So uh, z squared times z2 is a, a counterexample. Um, yeah, right. Um, but a, the problem with trying to do any more than this is that graph miners um, aren't a QI invariant. So, uh, you know, you have some graphs which are planar, which are QI, the graphs which are not even minor excluded. So it's uh, it becomes very hard to make any meaningful deductions beyond what's already been said. Um, um, but this has been a topic of some discussion recently and uh, popularized is, uh, is this idea of fat miners. Um, so rather than just looking at minors in a Cayley graph, we look at the fat minors in our Cayley graph. Um, so I'll give you the definition and I'll try and give you some intuition. Um, but let's take a graph gamma and a finite graph H and some constant K, which is like a coarseness constant. Um, and then a, this definition looks like a lot to digest, but I, will, it's, I promise you it's quite intuitive. Um, then a K fat H minor is some subgraph M, which de decomposes into pieces. Uh, M is itself an H minor in, in gamma. Um, but essentially what we have is we have these pieces, the UV, which are indexed by the vertices of um, of H. You just imagine these as like sort of vertex spaces. And then you have these PEs, which are the paths that connect the vertex spaces together. And they form like a big copy of H. Um, and the K comes in by saying that the if these pieces are not adjacent in the graph, then they need to be really far apart in our in gamma. Um, so, for example, the picture to have in mind is um, we go thinking about fat miners. That's an unfortunate title. Um, but one should picture a, a a fat copy of of H in gamma, where all the parts are spread apart. So here's our copy of H, um, and then in gamma we see this M, which is our fat. H and you sort of see we have these like the tax spaces, the UVs, which correspond to the vertices of H, and and we have the the edge paths joining them together to sort of recreate the structure of H. And anything which shouldn't be close together isn't close together, isn't close together. So unless they are literally like joined in the graph, uh things are spread out, things are really spread out. Um where how spread out they need to be is quantified by this K. Uh, now, H is called an asymptotic minor of gamma if gamma contains a K fat H minor for all K. And the benefit of this definition is that the asymptotic minors of a graph are QI invariants. Uh, this is kind of easy to show. Um, and so we can start to reason about the asymptotic minors in our group. Um, um, so let me just talk about a conjecture which was made 
in the last few years. So uh, there was a conjecture of Yorkopoulos and Papazoglu uh, that says that if you have a connected, let's say locally finite graph and a finite a gamma and a finite graph H, then gamma is a QI to some graph which has no H minor on the nose, if and only if uh, H is not an asymptotic minor of gamma. So somehow these, the conjecture is that these fat minors, uh, these asymptotic minors, uh, essentially correspond to quasi-isometries to graphs with no minors on the nose. Um, and this would be a really nice thing to be true, because if this was true, then you can essentially use it to lift the entire theory of, of graph minors to the course setting and start to study and basically get all of the results for free for fat minors, because um, it turns out they're basically the same thing. Um, now, uh, sadly, um, it was proven, I think this year maybe, uh, by Davis et al, that, uh, that counterexamples exist, which is unfortunate. So you can't quite get this. Uh, uh, the paper in question has a, a nice title, which is Fat Miners Cannot Be Thinned, which I think is funny. Um, Jamie Oliver hates this paper, as you can imagine. Um, that's a stupid joke. Uh, anyway, but there's another conjecture, which is a bit more interesting and is still open and probably true, uh, which is the following. So. A graph gamma is called asymptotically minor excluded if there exists some finite graph, which is not an asymptotic minor of our graph. Uh, and now the the conjecture from the same paper is the following. So if I let G be a finitely generated blank, that should be a group uh, with the Cayley graph gamma, then the conjecture is that G is virtually planar if and only if uh, its Cayley graph is asymptotically minor excluded. Um, so one direction of this is kind of easy. Uh, if you're virtually planar, then because asymptotic minors are a QI invariant, you certainly can't be, well, you have to be asymptotically minor excluded. Uh, the converse seems harder. Um, um, yeah, it turns out this uh, conjecture is true for finitely presented groups, um, um, uh, which is a result of mine. Sorry, I've just confused myself because I think I think the next slide is going to be confusing. Um, I'm going to repeat myself, but if uh, if a uh, so yeah, it turns out this conjecture is true for finitely presented groups. It's still open for finitely generated groups in general, but um, uh, it's ended up being true for finitely presented groups. Um, and so some corollary of this is that if you're a finitely presented group G and you look inside your QI class and within that QI class you find some minor excluded graph, then that's enough again to deduce that your group is virtually planar. So once again, just some mundane object sitting inside your QI class has forced very strong uh, structural restrictions onto your onto your group. Um, and yeah, um, this slide is now saying the same thing again. Uh, I guess what I can point out here is that uh, the proof of this theorem is very, um, it's very, it's very hands on, you essentially uh, have to use the geometry of your group to actually just build the miners. And uh, you can see some examples of how this is done here. It's quite a fun thing to do if you ever ever have a a, a free Saturday, I suggest, um, you know, finding your favorite groups and looking for fat miners within them. It's a, it's a good activity. Um, anyway, maybe not. Um, but yeah, in the last uh, couple of minutes, I want to talk about one more uh, conjectural characterization, which I think is my favorite. And this is wide open, um, but I strongly believe it to be true. So what do I think? Uh, well, let me introduce one more definition. So a um, given some constant K, at least zero, a graph gamma is called K planar if it can be drawn in the plane such that every edge crosses at most K other edges. So somehow it's not quite a perfect drawing, but it's kind of like boundedly bad. Um, and then we say that our graph gamma is almost planar if it is, some, if it is K planar for some K. Um, so again, this doesn't really make sense for finite graphs, um, but for infinite graphs, this is interesting. So uh, for example, if you have the Cayley graph, standard Cayley graph of um, Z squared times Z2, then it looks a bit something like this. Uh, and you can kind of see that in this drawing, it's not a planar graph by any means, uh, but in this drawing, every edge crosses at most one other edge. So this is a one planar graph, it's almost planar. Um, um, now, um, it turns out that uh, the almost planarity you can show is a QI invariant amongst bounded valence graphs. Um, if you want something to do, try and prove this yourself. I think it's quite a fun thing to try and prove. Uh, I 
I proved this myself and then I realized that it was already known. Um, uh, but yeah, Benjamin and Tram proved it in like 1999 or something like that. Um, but in particular, the fact that it's a QI invariant means that virtually planar groups all have almost planar Cayley graphs, which kind of makes sense. Um, and now the final conjecture that I want to mention is simply that the converse holds. So your Koplos and Papazoglu, the dream team, uh, uh, they conjecture, well, they conjecture that if you're a, if you find a group in the street and you draw its Cayley graph, then its drawing doesn't look too bad. You know, it's almost planar. Uh, then it turns out that that group must be virtually planar, conjecturally at least. Uh, I don't really know how to prove this. I think it's a it's an it's an interesting problem. Um, it turns out that almost planarity is equivalent to essentially having a regular map if you're a coarse geometer from um from your graph into some kind of planar surface. Um, uh, I think the key word that Benjamin and Schramm use is uh, quasi-monomorphism, whatever that means. Uh, but yeah, if you have any ideas about this, you know, please let me know because I think it's a very it's a very funny problem and I would like to work on it. But anyway, uh, that's all I have to say. So uh, here's some reading and some more propaganda, but thanks for listening. Okay, thanks very much, Joe. Uh, let's thank our speaker.